So hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar in the IWP EU webinar series. I can see people are still coming in, so I will just do a little bit of blah blah in the beginning uh, before we really kick off so that we can get as many participants in as possible. But it's really uh, just three o'clock European time. So uh, I know we have many participants also from the other side of the pond. So good morning to you and happy to see you here early in the morning. I hope you had your coffee. And for the rest of us, it's afternoon here in Europe. Okay, so let's let's get started. Hello and welcome everyone and uh, happy to see so many participants on the first of our uh, webinar series in the IWP EU series for spring 2023. And I will start with a little bit of housekeeping. So um, we do provide captions and you can show uh, select the CC, the closed caption icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we also provide uh, the, a link to captions in English, the live captions uh, in a link that one of my colleagues will uh, put in the chat if you pre prefer to see the captions uh, separately. We also provide automatic translations of the captions into French, German, Spanish, and Swedish. So, vous pouvez lire les sous-titres en français si vous suivez le lien fourni dans le chat. Sie können das auf Deutsch lesen, wenn Sie dem in chat angegebenen Link folgen. Puedes leer el español si sigues en el arte provisto en el chat. Du kan läsa texten på svenska om du klickar på länken som vi lägger i chatten. And today we also have Czech translations and I will ask my dear colleague Radek to uh, say this in Czech because I cannot do that. Dobrý den, pokud chcete sledovat simultánní tlumočení do češtiny, tak si přes tlačítko interpretation uh, vyberte uh, český kanál a můžete potom celou dobu mít k dispozici simultánní tlumočení. Děkuji and hands over to Susana. Děkuji, I know, I know that's, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Děkuji, Radek, and your colleagues. Thank you for doing this. It's fantastic that we reach also uh, a little bit at least of the eastern part of Europe with your um, live interpretation. That's that's super cool that we can do even more in, in the EU uh, uh, ecosystem, if you will. So we do, of course, also provide sign language, as you can see, and please use the Q&A function for any questions. You can pose your questions anywhere, uh, anytime during the presentation, but we will respond to them verbally after the presentation. And the chat will be monitored by my colleagues in the US, Malcolm and Rachel, for any technical questions. And your microphones are muted to prevent any background noise. So my name is uh, Susanna Lorin. I'm the IWP EU representative, uh, and I plan and manage uh, these webinar series. If we can have the next slide, please. Um, today, we are extremely happy to welcome uh, Loic Martinez Norman from the University, uh, Polytechnical University of Madrid, uh, and also a good friend of mine. We have been working together on the, uh, the EN301549 for many years than I almost can remember. So uh, this has been one of the asks for many of our members and also other people to understand kind of the differences between the EN and the WCAG and how does the monitoring work? Why do you monitor more things in the EU than we do in the US? What is this all about? And, and how do we interpret the, the Annex A of the standard and so on? So we have loads and loads of questions about around this. And I've asked one of the most clever people I know to present one piece of this puzzle at least. And, and that is where uh, the EN goes beyond WCAG, but still um, what has to do with, with the web requirements. And this is what is, of course, um, probably most interesting for any developer, designer, or auditor, tester that tries to support uh, clients or have an own uh, website or app that, that um, needs to comply with the, uh, with the Web Accessibility Directive. So really happy to have you here, Loic, and now and even more congratulations to everyone else that don't have to listen to me speaking about the ENs. So now you will hear another voice doing this. So please, Loic, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Susanna. Uh, let me start sharing. Okay, that should be it. Hopefully you can all see the slides. Uh, yes. Thank you, Susanna, for your kind words. And thank you to the IWP for inviting me to speak about this interesting subject. And first of all, I want to uh, let's say in advance, I apologize for my speed of speaking, which might be difficult for interpreters and captioners. Uh, so I, I'm sorry if I go too fast sometimes. Just let, let me know and I will try to reduce my speed. Um, so um, Susanna asked me to, to, to talk about what's in the European standard for uh, ICT accessibility beyond WCAG for web content. And, and I also would like to first start um, to explain why this happened and then try to go into the details of, of what impact does it have for web content to try to support EN, the EN301549 in addition to Wicca. So let's start with a bit of history. Uh, and as Susanna has told you, uh, we started working in this many years ago and I have a vivid memory of it due to personal reasons. So it was September 27. That day, my youngest son was born. And the same day that he was born, I received a phone call uh, from the Spanish Standard Organization to tell me, congratulations, you have been selected to be an expert uh, in the Monday 376 work, which was the start of the work that then afterwards led to the EN many years later. So today my son is 15 years old and so is the work that started then uh, in 27. And, and the EN has now 186 pages from a starting of zero pages for many years. The first version of the EN was published in 2014 uh, with around 140 pages. Then we had a new version uh, in published in 2018 with 160, 160 pages, more or less. And finally, the current version published in 2021, which has 186 pages uh, and probably will grow in the next version when we deal with the uh, European Accessibility Act. Uh, so probably it's going to get bigger, not smaller over the years. Uh, so I. The reason to speak about that is to clarify uh, that I've been involved in the work of these standards is the very beginning of the technical work. Um, and so hopefully I can provide you some insights about what happened and why does um, the EN go beyond WCAG. So um, 27 was the year we started phase one of the mandate and it was a research stage we wanted to know what was about accessibility requirements, different sources for those requirements, also some agreements about what the structure of the, of the standard would be, what, what would be the contents and things like that. Uh, at the end of that phase, one of the agreements was to uh, use the uh, web content accessibility guidelines level AA as the basis for the web accessibility requirements. So we would not duplicate or having different requirements for the web. And we wanted nothing more and nothing less. So th that was the purpose. But then another thing happened and, and the reason why the EN goes beyond WCAG for web is because of the philosophy of the structure of the standard itself. So in phase one, we also agreed that we could not have a structure based on product categories because in the information and communication technology domain, there's so many things crossing borders in, in between the products. We have a smartphone today, which could also be thought as a personal computer, can also be a scanner, can also be so many things that it, it was not useful to have a standard organized by product categories. We agreed to organize the standard on feature or functionality. And this decision led to having requirements that were not initially thought for the web, but then do apply to web, depending on what the web is doing for users. So this is uh, relevant 
if uh, we are applying um, the EN to conform to the Web Accessibility Directive, the European legislation for websites and mobile applications of uh, the public sector. And this is also uh, detailed in the content of the EN in Annex A. In fact, there's, there are two tables in Annex A and Table A.1 is a table that defines which of the requirements of the EN apply to websites uh, to conform to the legislation in Europe. So if we don't look at the EN, and, uh, sorry, at Annex A, and we just look at the titles of the chapters with the requirements in the EN, we might think that EN only has one chapter for web, which is called web, is chapter nine. And it is the one that is equivalent to WCAG AA as is. So everything that is in WCAG AA, all the success criteria of level A and AA of WCAG are included in chapter nine of uh, the EN. But if we go to Annex A and we see the details, there are other sections of the EN that also apply to web. Um, so we have the general requirements, which is a section for requirements that apply to any type of information and communication technology products and services. Then we have chapter six, which is for ICT that is providing communication between people. And yes, if the web provides communication between people, we will need to look at this chapter six. Chapter seven is for ICT that has video capabilities that can play, edit, record, transmit video. If it's so, and if a web is doing this type of activities, then there are specific requirements. Of course, no hardware on the web, so chapter eight is not there. Of course, nothing for non-web documents because we are in the web domain. But then again, we go back and chapter 11, which is a software, there are some specific sections in this chapter that are also applicable to web. And chapter 12 about documentation and support services is also applicable if uh, these documentation and support services do exist for the web we are dealing with. Um, so this is the map of what I'm going to talk about in the next minutes. Um, my plan is to go section by section, providing a highlights of, of which parts apply, which parts don't apply. And more importantly, I think, what's the impact on web design or, uh, or accessibility evaluation of web content uh, when you deal with the EN instead of just dealing with uh, Wicca? And then my reply is, uh, let's say a Galician reply from the Northwest of, uh, of Spain. We, they, we have this idea, funny idea of them. They always uh, avoid replying to questions and they will just reply, it depends. But this is, yes, it depends. Uh, depending on what the purpose of the web content is, it will have to conform to some chapters of the EN or not. And I'm, I'm going to try and to try to explain when uh, web pages or websites do need to take a look at different sections in the EN. So that's my purpose uh, from now to the end of the uh, presentation. So let's start with the generic requirements. So these are requirements for any type of information and communication technology. They were uh, written in a form that they would apply to hardware, to software, to electronic documents, to anything. Uh, so there's one section 5.1 about cloud functionality, which does not apply for web because the web as it is technologically, it is not close. It's always an open functionality in relation to assistive products. So 5.1 is nothing relevant there, but then we have a section on activation of accessibility features. So if the web has a specific, the website we're dealing with, the one we are designing or evaluating, has specific features that people can activate, then we have to look at 5.2. Uh, one example that I have found is uh, Google Docs, as web applications do have a setting, um, activate a screen reader mode or read a screen reader uh, compatibility mode and that people can activate. And then you have to look at this requirement for that functionality. Then we have biometrics. Uh, 
Uh, so there's a requirement on enabling alternatives to biometrics, and it applies to the web if the web uses biometrics. And currently, the APIs for web authentication uh, do consider biometrics as, as one of the possibilities of providing uh, user uh, authentication. In that case, if the web is dealing with biometrics, so if the web is um, uh, has an authentication based method that uses the biometric features of the hardware, then it has to look at 5.3. Uh, next section is preservation of accessibility information during conversion. It applies to web content if the web content converts information. And one example in, in, uh, in some tools that exist in the web, we can save as different formats the content we are designing. And in that process, the content that has been created using the web is transformed, is converted into a different format. And in that case, if the original format has accessibility information and we use this web tool to transform it, yes, the web transformation process has to deal with 5.4. And then there are two easy things, operable paths and locking or toggle controls, which relate to the, uh, let's say, buttons on the web content. Uh, and yes, we have to deal with them, but the good news here is that both of them uh, are covered if the web content conforms to uh, web content accessibility guidelines, basically by providing um, keyboard access and by controlling what happens on input and on focus, you are covered. There's nothing more you need to do here. So it's WCAG conformant content will cover 5.5, 5.6 directly. So that's the picture for generic requirements. Yes, there are things to look at for web content. Uh, some of them are easy to do because you are already doing it if you are conforming to WCAG and the three that don't depend on what you're doing in the web content. Second chapter that uh, provides new requirements for web content that are not in WCAG is uh, section six on two-way voice communication. So this applies to the web if the web is providing voice communication between people. Uh, for instance, for any of you that is not using the Zoom native application, but the Zoom web access to connect to this, uh, that web-based Zoom version is web content, and then it ha has to conform to chapter six. Um, and it has to do it whether or not it also uh, includes video communication. So if I can speak, then I need to deal with chapter six. Uh, first one is audio bandwidth for speech, which is asking for a good enough audio quality which is straightforward to meet because it's basically telephone, let's say old telephone audio quality, which can be done by almost any technology today with ease. So that one, yes, it exists as a requirement, but it's just will be done basically automatically by any new technology or current technology. Then we have the real deal of chapter six with this real-time text functionality. And yes, if web content is providing communication between persons in voice, then it should also provide real-time text functionality. Um, the basic technology for implementing that you can see on the screen is using the web real-time communication API combined with a specification of real-time text over it, which is this, uh, document 8865 from the uh, internet uh, organization. And um, I have a slide showing you one example of, of one web uh, demonstration application that shows that. Okay, so let's move into the next one is color ID. So if the web content enables people to people communication and, and it provides identification of who's calling, then it has to provide that information in an accessible way. And I've identified this as an easy requirement. Basically, if the web content is conforming to WCAG, that information will be there, will be available to screen readers and other assistive products, so you're meeting 6.3. Um, there are chapter 6.4 about alternatives of voice-based services, which is going beyond what the web is doing 
uh, as thinking about what the services are around this web. So if, if the web is providing person-to-person -person communication, and in addition to that, it provides functionality of voice mailing or, or an automatic voice response system, then um, uh, yes, you have to look at 6.4. Uh, many web pages that provide voice communication do not offer these additional services. So in many cases, 6.4 does not apply. And if the web content in addition to voice communication enables video communication at the same time, yes, there's a chapter for that. You have to deal with some requirements of video quality, but this, again, uh, as I told you with the audio bandwidth for speech is something that in the current state of technology, uh, should be supported by mostly any video conference system, the quality of video that is necessary for sign language and lip reading. So that one, yes, if you're providing this type of communication, but easy to do. And uh, in chapter six, we do have a final uh, section on alternatives to video-based services related to something similar to the services in 6.4. So if there's a video-based, uh, mail and uh, video-based interactive voice response and things, services like that, they have to meet 6.6, .6, which is basically providing alternatives. As I have said for 6.4, is the same thing. Most of the web uh, content that is providing two-way voice communication is not providing any of these additional services, so there's nothing there to deal with. Okay, so this is an example of a web-based uh, prototype uh, developed as a web page. It's from the Gallaudet University. Uh, it's not difficult to find. You just look for Gallaudet University and real-time text, and you, you can open different browsers in different computers, connect to the same session, and, and use this real-time text communication that in the screenshot looks a lot like a current normal chat when you have messages um, interchanged between people. The main difference is that in real-time text, when you type, your letters are sent to the other person in the communication in life. So you, you see the letters as they are typed by the other person. That's the main difference between real-time text and chat. Let's move into chapter seven. Chapter seven applies to ICT with video capabilities. It will apply to the web. If the web can play videos, can record videos, can edit videos, uh, or can convert video formats. It is not the requirements about the video themselves, but about the, the functionality that is performing the playing, recording, transforming of the video. Uh, so it's a slight difference from in WCAG, you do have requirements that video content has to provide captions, has to provide audio descriptions, but this is about how you deal with captions and audio descriptions if they exist. So chapter 7.1 is about processing captions. And yes, if the web content has video and has a tool for playing the videos and the video has captions, then... Uh, uh, yes, you have to deal with that and you have to provide the captions if they exist, you have to uh, display them in a synchronized way, you have to preserve captions if you are recording or transforming videos. And then there's an additional requirement about spoken subtitles that I will describe in the next slide uh, because it's an interesting different concept that does not exist in WCAG, uh, which is an additional uh, accessibility service quite relevant in countries that do not uh, translate the audio of content, but they use subtitles instead. Section 7.2 is about audio description. And if the video content has audio description and we have a web content display in that video, then yes, it has to play the audio description, provide good synchronization and preserve the audio description if it exists. And finally, there's a section about the user controls for turning on and off captions and uh, audio description. And yes, you have to provide that. Normally, <clears throat> most video players of web content that have been developed to take into account accessibility requirements will meet these requirements without many difficulties. But one 
word of advice, don't rely on the features of the native video player of the web browsers because they don't fully meet everything. And, and then you're relying on some technology you're not controlling. But there are many uh, video players built on top of that that do have accessibility uh, in mind. And I'm going to show you one in a couple of slides later. So let me show you an example of spoken subtitles. This is not a web application, but a desktop application, but I think it's interesting to know how they work. Let me first explain what spoken subtitles are, and then I will show you how it works. So spoken subtitles is an accessibility features for people who cannot see. So it is an accessibility service equivalent to audio description for blind people or uh, people with low vision. Um, it is very useful in countries where the video content is not translated in audio, but translated in subtitles. And then once we have this translation into subtitles, if I am a blind person watching television in those countries, uh, like Portugal or uh, many of your countries probably, and I'm listening to this content, I will only get the original language could be Japanese or whatever. In the example I'm going to show you, the really original language is Japanese. Then it has subtitles in English. And um, in this demonstration, the spoken subtitles feature is turned on. So the subtitles that are in English are then spoken with text-to-speech technology. So the blind person who is understanding English instead of Japanese can at least get this input, right? This is this service. So let me play the video, it's very short. Uh, so you're going to see the video content barely hearing in the background the Japanese original language. And then you are going to see the subtitles in English and hearing the text-to-speech of the subtitles in English. Start to have a beginning. But are by their own power destroyed. Finite. Right. So might be difficult to follow, but this is a service for blind people. So if I'm a blind person that I cannot understand Japanese, at least I will listen to the subtitles in English, as spoken by the technology. So that's a requirement on spoken subtitles. Okay, an example of an accessible video player for the web is Able Player. It's not the only one. There are several of them. Uh, the reason why I'm, I'm showing you Able Player is because it's one of the few I have found that can provide audio description from text. So you can use the uh, web VTT format for captions that can only be used, also be used for audio descriptions and can do text or speech of these audio descriptions recorded in text format. And in that case, it conforms to the requirements of 7.2 about audio descriptions, being able to turn them on and off and providing them in synchronized way. Okay, we're moving towards the end of the sections. We have sections 11 on software. Um, so web content is software which means that in principle, web content should also conform to chapter 11, but most of chapter 11 is for non-web software. That is software that is developed, not using web technologies. Uh, a few sections of 11 do have impact on web, uh, like 11.6.1 on the disruption on accessibility features, but that one, for instance, is normally met because uh, for web content to not meet 11.6.1, the web content should interfere with the normal behavior of the browser and what the browser is providing, which is not normally the case. So 11.6.1 is, in my uh, understanding, easy to conform to. Then we have 11.7 users preferences. So if the user is setting up preferences for fonts, font sizes, colors, and things like that, then the web content should follow it. And, and again, normally it does because um, uh, web content normally is not disrupting these features of browsers. So normally it will be met by web content. And we have a, a really specific section is 11.8 about authoring tools. So if the web content is an authoring tool, which means it's software can, that can be used to create or modify web content, images, videos, text, 
then it has to conform to a minimum set of requirements related to um, being able to create accessible content to convert accessibility information from one format to another one, uh, providing uh, assistance to users to repair uh, accessibility issues. Uh, but it is a really minimum set of requirements. And in fact, uh, I would expect that uh, if someone is developing an authoring tool using web technologies, they would conform or try to conform to the uh, authoring tool accessibility guidelines attack. And then it will also meet 11.8 by far. I mean, there's many more things in attack than, um, than in 11.8 in the EM. The final section that is, has content related to web uh, is documentation and support system. If the web content has product documentation, like help pages that explain how to use the content, how to access it, or if the web content has support services for customers, and that's something that normally doesn't happen, but if they have, they have to meet chapter 12. So chapter 12.1 is about the documentation. So if the web content has help pages, they have to provide information on accessibility features and the web help pages have to be inaccessible. And uh, in my understanding, this is straightforward because if your goal is to provide uh, web um, content that is accessible, that is meeting WCAG 2.0, then normally your help pages will also be accessible because it's part of the same effort. A different question is 12.2 about support services. This only applies if there are external services to the web that explain how to use the web or provide, let's say, uh, customer support for people who are using the web. So you can, for instance, in Spain, um, so in Spain, we do have a telephone number 010 for the cities to provide support for citizens. And if some of the things you can ask them is how to use the web to do some of the services the city provides for you. So in this example, we have a support service that part of its work is to explain how to use the web of the municipality to do some activities. And then in that case, those services should conform to 12.2. But this is a little bit outside of the web content itself. But normally, the service as a whole will be developed together, both the information for the support services and the web content. So it, no, it, it will normally get information from the same side of things. OK, so that's basically it. Uh, I think I've been hopefully not too fast for interpreters and captioners. Uh, in summary, uh, I have basically two main ideas. First idea is that the European Standard 301549 of ICT Accessibility goes beyond WCAG for web content. Uh, it is important to know that if one is developing or uh, evaluating a web page of website that has to uh, meet the web and the European um, Web Accessibility Directive, then it has to look more than just WCAG 2 level A, AA accessibility. It has to go to the EN and check what happens. And the amount of additional work for developers or evaluators depends on the functionality of the web content and not how it is done. So in my personal opinion, WCAG is more about how the web content is developed and the other chapters in the EN are more about what the web content does for people. And depending on what it's doing, if it's providing voice communication, then you have additional requirements. If it's providing video capabilities, then you have section seven, and so on and so forth. And that's basically it. Hopefully it has been interesting. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you. So thank you very much, Lloyd. This was indeed very interesting and uh, we have got loads of questions so i think also the the audience could follow very well you have got a lot of good um, applause and thank yous because your uh, presentation is easy to follow and and understandable so thank you for that uh, standards are complex matters so very well done to be very pedagogical in this so and we have got several questions about the presentation, and I don't think you and I actually talked about that. So now I'm putting you on the spot. Will you share this presentation or may we share the presentation with the people? You can, of course. Yes. Yes. I've made my best to make it accessible, 
might not be 100 percent but I've, I've tried to so all the images do have descriptions i have checked for keyboard accessibility and things like that so yes the slides are uh, free for you to distribute no worries okay thank you very much so people will be happy we have uh we had some kind of more generic questions in the beginning so first uh, a discussion in the chat also about the en so en stands for european norm so it means really european standard and the the en 301549 and no i i do not know what, where the uh, number comes from but i guess it's just kind of the, it was the okay, next number that's <laughs> fine uh okay so uh, this european standard is um in fact, the first European standard that was developed at this, uh, uh, with the three European standards organization together. So it has the first time ever that this happened. But the uh, writing uh, work of the standard was made in ETSI, the European Telecom Standardization uh, Institute. And they have this um, numbering based on consecutive numbers. And that's it. So it was the next number. I don't know why. I mean, has no relation whatsoever to what the content, the group dealing with it, nothing. It's just a number. But it's a good number. So, and we also have- <laughs> I mean, it's good for us because we know it, but that's it. This it's is long, it. I know, it's long. But, um, and then we have several questions on, on the same theme, uh, connecting the EN standard to the European Accessibility Act. And that is kind of a, um, a longer response. So the EN301549 is one out of several standards that will be updated. There is a new mandate now. So the joint working group where Loike and I work together with many other experts, we are going to look at and update the EN301549, but also other standards will be updated. So the EN17161 on design for all and the EN17210 on uh, the built environment, uh, they will also be updated to um, act as the presumed conformance for the Accessibility Act. And then um, we and or other experts in other groups will also um, create three new standards. So the mandate contains the updates of three standards and also the creation and development of three new standards uh, and also an update of two technical requirements. So many things. The EN301549 does not cover everything that will be the presumed conformance of the European Accessibility Act, but the Act also differs from the Web Accessibility Directive in the way that it in itself has some requirements. So often we get the question, how are we ever supposed to meet the Accessibility Act that is uh, applicable from uh, 2025 if you haven't got the standards in place yet? And that is a, it's a valid point, but there is already uh, quite a lot of uh, requirements, technical requirements in the law itself. So you can happily start working on it now. And of course you can use uh, the EN and the other the, uh, the three ENs that are already out there to, to support you on that. But it's important to understand, um, especially for non-European listeners, I think, that the law is the law and the standard is the presumed conformance, but it's not it's not the um, a law in itself. The standard is still voluntary. It's just a very good way to meet the requirements in the directives, but it's not in the law itself. So that is kind of the important difference, but we're working on it. So it, there will be updates, uh, many updates on, on all of this. Um, so authoring tools, a couple of questions on 11.8. Authoring tools, uh, is the 11.8 uh, clause based on ATAG or is it a separate entity? Like It is based on ATAG, but it was written when ATAG 2.0 was not yet formally a uh, recommendation from WCAG. So we could not take everything and we decided to take the most important bits in a higher level uh, requirement. So we ask the tool to enable the creation of accessible content, to help the developer, the designer to create accessible content, to provide suggestions how to repair things that are not good, that the tool can identify as not being accessible. And what was it? To provide at least one accessible template if the tool is providing templates. So it's just, let's say the basic, really basic requirements for an authoring tool. But my strong suggestion, if, if anyone is developing an authoring tool based on web or based on anything, you just go to ATAC. Uh, it is compatible. I mean, if you're meeting the authoring tools, accessibility guidelines, you're going to meet with ease 11.8. 
Thank you. And another question on authoring tool is if you could provide a, an example of how a website can be an authoring tool. You mentioned it briefly, but I think- it Google may... Docs is an authoring tool uh, for Excel, for Word, for whatever. Uh, the Microsoft Office versions, web versions are also authoring tools by themselves. And then there are many tools on the web that are authoring tools. Like let's say, for instance, when my children use a lot Canva, to design content for presenting in the classroom. Uh, so anything on the web that you use to create content is an authoring tool. Uh, yeah, there are many examples. Okay, thank you. And another specific question about a specific uh, piece here is, can you give an example of units of measure quote, uh, required by 11.7 .7 user preferences? Okay, so... Uh, User preferences in 11.7 .7 is about, I, I will have to check the standard, I don't know by, by heart, I don't know why. I uh, should know them by heart, my 186 pages, but I haven't. But basically, <laughs> uh, as it was written, it says that if the user has defined presentation properties in the operating system, platform software, then software should adapt to that or should have at least one mode of operation that just takes the standard properties from the user. So if if the user has defined my preferred font size, my preferred foreground and background colors, I need a way of um, activating that in my software application. For the web domain, this is in fact easier because web browsers have the possibility of activating user base or user defined uh, CSS which imply that your the web is not the one you have designed, but the one that people need to see. So people normally, a uh, typical example is people with low vision will have their own created CSS, maybe by themselves, or maybe with the help of some technical people that are around them, in which they might have, for instance, they might have like blue background, yellow letters, and an 18 point size or something like that as a minimum point size. And then suddenly, if the user activates that in the browser, all the web content will be shown that way. At least everything that is text. Then, of course, if there's uh, image-based content, that part of it will not adapt, and then it might be something that might not work. But of course, if there's text alternative for that, then you should be covered. Thank you, Loic. So now I'm trying to read also the chat and I would like to ask you to use the Q&A function because that makes life much easier for me if I get all the questions in one go, but I'll, I'll try to, to read a little bit in the chat as well. So can you give an example of closed functionality? It's never applied to web content, right? Okay, so no, it is not. I mean, there's no way the web can be made closed functionality. Closed functionality means that the user cannot use assistive products, cannot activate them, cannot install them. So that's the definition of closed functionality. Classical example of assistant with closed functionality would be a, a public access kiosks or an ATM. So an ATM is closed. People cannot go there and install software on them, uh, basically for security reasons. So there's, it has to provide accessibility by itself. But the web content is made using web technologies, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and it is interpreted by a web browser, which means it is there always. It is always there. I mean, it can be accessed by the web browser, by assistive products on top of the web browser, or instead of the web browser, it will work. So it, it is not ever, at least unless they radically change the principles of web content, it is not close functionality. Thank you. And we do get questions on having a, a session on the European Accessibility Act. I'm happy to provide that. We have done several, but but absolutely, we will have more of those. And, and I know that is a request that keeps coming back. So, so don't worry, we will come back to the European Accessibility Act as such, because that requires much more time than we have now during this short Q&A. 
So we get a question more like now we are uh, taking off our IWP hats and putting on our joint working group hats, I guess, <laughs> but uh, but concerning WCAG, anyone can create issues on GitHub to which the working group um, will respond and such a place where anyone could submit questions, suggestions and receive binding documented answers would be very helpful also for the European standardization work. Are there any efforts in this regard? Loik, this is not your responsibility, but I think you know what we are working with. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Could you rephrase? I mean, the question I, I didn't lost in the middle of it. Um, so it just, uh, how can people who are not part of the joint working group uh, add things? How can, how can we, how do we make sure from the standardization world that people outside of the standardization groups are also uh, able to uh, put in requests or, or ask things or, you know, uh, contribute to the standard work? So uh, FC, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute has created a JIP lab implementation for the EN, which I don't know the link, but we can find it and provide it afterwards, uh, where people can raise issues and can provide comments and suggestions for change uh, the EN. And I guess, or at least Etsy intention is that we use that tool uh, in the updating process of the EN for the European Accessibility Act in the future, so that will be one opportunity. And, and then uh, from the joint working group, we're going to disseminate our activity and <laughs> to as many entities we can and to try to get more as more feedback as we can. Once we start, we haven't started the work to update the end uh, yet. We'll be starting soon, I hope. I hope so too. So I put the link in the chat uh, to the GitLab, and and it's a it's a valid point. Uh, it it may seem sometimes that it is that uh, it is kind of blurred. It is a little bit uh, difficult to kind of get through to the standardization work sometimes because, but that is because there are these three big organizations working together uh, in this specific standard. So it it's kind of more more complicated than 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 usually <laughs> to to get through but we do welcome uh, anything from anyone uh, and of course the best way is to be part of either etsy if you uh, like the kind of the industry part of the standardization or your national standardization body and then uh, that way go get into the sensenelec system as well but but uh, we are very open to to anyone, uh, any questions or contributions or anything. And I'm currently the, the chair of the joint working group. So please, if you, if something is not to your liking, then it's all my fault. So please just throw me an e email and we'll make sure we can do as, as much as possible to get everyone needs to be on board. We have loads of things to do. And um, it's really important that we get uh, input from <laughs> as many different stakeholders as possible. So, so very happy to, to hear anyone out on this. So related to that, there's a comment on the chat that the, it is close to users that have to register, but there's a mechanism for people to send emails to raise issues or make proposals, which I have copied uh, in the chat for everyone. So if you can, you don't want to be registered or don't or can't register in the GitLab, you can still send an email to that address, hfsupport at etsy.org, and then in that suggesting will be processed and taken into account. Thank you. So, so we have another question. Uh, are there any testing methodologies developed for testing specifically for the EN301549, something to complement the testing methodology to WCAG? No, that I, that, that I know of. I mean, not not no, not from the Europe, the joint working group or official entity, maybe um, specific companies have developed something but not that they know of no exactly it's a, it's a bit uh, it differs among the member states and and also in the industry i think and when we did the review of the web accessibility directive we saw that in different member states they have approached this in different ways and definitely i think it's a there is a need kind of general need for a shake up of the accessibility uh, companies to to provide more testing on on these requirements because in some member states they said that they couldn't find experts who could do this so they 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 couldn't do it in the monitoring but now this this work has really kind of kick started after the first round of monitoring and also the member states who did not check the en uh, requirements they are 
I'm sure um, they are now really focusing on um, on getting that up to speed. But it's a good question, and and more is needed. And we also saw in the review that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, of testing tools and automate, automated tools and so on, and many of those are, are not created in Europe. So, of course, they are based on, on other, other ways of, of looking at, at accessibility. So there is, a, there is a gap in the market, I think, and for any European uh, company that would like to, to um, support that work and, and commit to, to the community, I think that would be really helpful and beneficial for, uh, for all of us. We also get questions around uh, translations, and the uh, that is again a kind of a, a setup question for the for the standardization. So this the Etsy, the EN three hundred one is free of charge, uh, developed in English and produced by or published by Etsy, and as a free of charge standard. But the translations are made by the national standardizations organizations in in each member state, and that. Um, standardization organization can decide to make a translation or not make a translation of the EN, and then they can also charge for it or not charge for it. So it's that's not really something, unfortunately, that we can um, influence or impact, we can try, but 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 that is, it's it's up to each uh, national standardization body to decide on that. So, and, and that is a problem, of course, um, in, in some countries, it's also kind of a mismatch between what the law says about uh, requirements should be presented in the local language and so on. So, so that that is a problem, but it, it has to do with the whole kind of process of, of how the standards are developed and, and the business models of this. Uh, so, and we got uh, certification questions, which I love to have, but it's not really the topic of today. So, so please join us for the certification drop-ins every other Wednesday. There is a specific free of charge for anyone, members or non-members alike, um, uh, certification webinar a drop-in session. So you can just register, and I believe we can put the if Rachel can put the link to the webinars in the uh, in the chat, please. Uh, you can just register there and you can ask any question the the certification specialists are there so um so i won't take up more time uh, time on that uh here but but you're always welcome to reach out to us of course with with any questions around certification but we we do uh, iwp does uh, professional certification so that is certifying uh, people professionals and not websites so just to to respond to that and we require uh, experience for the technical certifications. Um, <clears throat> so around the uh, 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 the wording of the requirements in EN301549 is very small. Many of the requirements are not sufficiently described. What do you recommend so we can get more information on how to interpret a specific request? Very good question. Um... <laughs> ask people who wrote it uh, could be the first answer. Uh, yes, I mean, we understand that, uh, but the part of the trouble is that the EN, it's already very long. And, and the purpose of a standard is to this, define the requirements and to teach about them. So you couldn't be included. Uh, we didn't have the resources or capability to do something similar to the intent sections in WCAG. Unfortunately, that could be nice to have, but it's not happening. Uh, but um, what could I say? I've been teaching about that and, uh, in my own university and in an open uh, uh, multi-user uh, content, but in Spanish, unfortunately. Uh, that would mean that not anyone can access that. Uh, and I know there's been some other efforts uh, made in the past, and that could be maybe repeated in the future to explain better EN or to noise. But yes, there's a gap there, as far as I know. There's no so many explanations. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, any thoughts on writing an understanding uh, document similar to the understanding of WCAG documents for the EN two hundred one five four nine? It's a it's a favorite question. It pops up. Every yeah, time. I'd love to, but uh, not anyone has the time or the resources to do that. Uh, yeah, we should do that sometime in the future. Uh, trouble is that 
the EN has not been stable, has been evolving in the last few years since it was published. First, because we had to deal with the Web Accessibility Directive. Now we're going to have to deal with the European Accessibility Act. So the main effort has always been into keeping the EN up to date to the requirements of the European legislation first. And, and, and then hopefully we could ask the European standard organizations to then do something about creating, uh, let's say a technical report to explain more about the EN. Could be nice, but it's again, something probably out of our hands are people writing the standard itself. Yes, but the more questions we get about it uh, around it, the more, I mean, the more re requests yeah. are sent to us, uh, the, the more is the possibility that we can actually ask for, for funding and, and get something done or, or ask somebody else, we could put together a group of experts uh, to do it, but, but there is a need of, of uh, commitment and, and money, of course, but if, if there, I, so keep, keep asking, it's a good, <laughs> it's a very good point and, and we need to have kind of a, a need or, or a, uh, requirements from from the community to to do anything of this so um thank you very much i think we need to wrap up uh, a little bit we have one question left around the, we have many questions left but but one about if we know if the wcag 2.2 will be included or kind of influence the en301549 and as we haven't started yet we cannot really answer that because we do not know uh, but we do of course try and also we got questions about kind of how we interact with with the um, with w3c and so on and there is a of course, an interaction and people who are in on both in both groups and and so on. So we try, of course, not to fragmentize, fragmentize, but but really to harmonize as much as possible. But we need to have stable standards and on on both sides. And the European path is kind of uh, influenced or or, or run really uh, by the European Commission and the legislation. So we need to follow the European way. Uh, but of course, no one is interested in having different standards in different parts of the world. That would be extremely bad, especially uh, to support the European Accessibility Act, as, as that will affect also uh, corporations that work over, over the borders and so on. So with this, we need to uh, unfortunately close the, the Q&A section. I think we'll have to invite you again, Loic, to continue this discussion um, because we had so many, so many questions. But I would like to say thanks a lot again uh, to you. It was uh, really brilliant. And thank you also for um, letting us provide the slides to our community. And thanks for all the good questions. Keep, keep asking them. Uh, if we know that you need more, then we can have another session on, on, on this or, or other things, of course. So just a little bit of a promotion for what's coming up um, uh, next week on the 31st sorry, of January, we have an IWP EU drop-in session. So that's just one hour where you, you need to register, but you are welcome to ask anything. So you can ask anything on EU policies or standards, uh, and many people come to ask about certification and membership and so on, but that is a specific drop-in uh, for EU. And uh, uh, we always have uh, members who talk about who can uh, we have a little panel of members uh, who respond to the questions from the audience and but we have no real um we don't have a presentation it's just a chit chat so very informal but very very popular and very good i think because we we get to understand what the members need from us and the members get response to all their questions so welcome welcome to join us on the 31st then we have the next webinar in this in this series which is on the 9th of february called Super Accessibility Immersive Media for All with Pilar Orero, so another university uh, person from, from Spain. So I don't know why we have that. We have two of them uh, beside each other, but another of my really good friends and, and a fantastic speaker. So uh, presenting on some of the really cool uh, research projects that they have done uh, lately. On the 28th of February, uh, the IWP Nordic uh, chapter is presenting an accessibility Accessible Documents um, webinar together with Annika Baltari from Finland and uh, Peter Kemeni from Hungary. It is in, in English, so everyone welcome, of course, that is also free of charge uh, and it's open for both members and non-members. And then for the German speaking crowd, we have a regional event uh, in the DACH chapter, the Germany and Germ Germany, Austria and German speaking parts of Switzerland on the 16th of February accessibility professionals live with Maria Putzhaber and Serena Lenes. I don't know 
where these people come from. So uh, sorry for any bad um, pronunciation of their names. So many things happening uh, as usual, and we are also planning an, uh, a hybrid event in Brussels just before the summer. I'll get back to that when we have a fixed date and a venue for that, but we are looking forward to, to seeing some of you face to face uh, this year again. So with that, I would like to thank our fantastic speaker, all the participants, our interpretation interpreters from all over, especially our friends in the Czech Republic who have done the live um, interpretation of this. And thank you, everyone. Keep up the good work and keep being interested in standards. It warms my heart that so many people are interested in this fantastic, exciting work that we are doing on standards. So have a nice day, everyone. Bye-bye.